This is the High Desert Luthery podcast, interviewing luthier Patrick Hepburn of Goateed Skull Guitars. I love it here. I moved, I've lived all around the country, and this is where I choose to make my home. Hi, this is Perry. Welcome to another episode of the High Desert Luthery podcast. Today I'm going to be talking with Patrick of Goateed Skull Guitars here in Albuquerque. Uh, we get into his love for cottonwood, a local timber, as well as uh, his love for electronics. Uh, Patrick will be at the next High Desert Luthery Invitational uh, 2024 in June. And I look forward to seeing what he brings to the show. I hope to see you all there. Enjoy the podcast. All right. Welcome to the High Desert Luthery Podcast. I'm Perry from Unga Guitars and the creator of of the High Desert Luthery Invitational, or HDLI for short. This is a show we put together uh, that's going to happen twice a year in celebration of luthiers, luthier-adjacent creators, musicians, and the art that comes from combining these things. The HDLI is a unique event that encourages actual support in the music community by providing free boosts to the vendors and free admission to the public. The event includes vendors and musicians that are curated by me to create a cohesive organized event. And uh, I keep saying vendors. So vendors will include uh, luthiers of all sorts, everything from luthiers to the musicians. What's involved in that? We've got amplifier makers. We've got people that make effects pedals. Uh, We're hoping to have some hardware companies come through. There will be a uh, wood store, the local uh, Albuquerque Exotic Woods will have a booth at the show where the majority of the local luthiers buy material. Uh, The whole goal of the HDLI, the High Desert Luthery Invitational, is to encourage community and collaboration amongst the artists. So we'll be pushing um, cross-promotion big time. Um, We want to get the musicians involved with the builders and... uh, just really build a strong community. This podcast is one way to help build that community and also help us get to know one another. Uh, to learn more about the show and the artists, please visit the website, highdesertlutery.com, where we have everyone participating in the show on the website with links to all their socials, Anywhere they are sharing music, uh, anything they want us to share for them is on the website, and that's highdesertluthery.com. Today's guest will be one of the luthiers at the next High Desert Luthery Invitational. That show will be uh, here in Albuquerque on Sunday, June 2nd. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm excited about this. So um, thanks for doing this, man. This is like so cool. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um i've been talking about doing a podcast like this for years um i started putting some gear together like when we were back in california and um the plan was to interview like um all of the players that i was doing work for like that local musicians cool. and yeah. and um i wanted to talk to them about their point of view or like how they felt about gear, like the gear that they used and why they made the decisions that, you know, they did. And, and um, I felt like at the time, no one was really talking about that. Um, It was more along the lines of like, you know, where are you from and what, you know, what inspired you to start playing and like just kind of the same old, same old. And um, I guess just being like a, a a repair guy, you know, like I, I had, detective questions <laughs> like, yeah no i totally agree with that man because in all honesty us researching is kind of how we learn i love learning and i love researching my superpowers and um <laughs> right on so i uh i totally would dig that because i lot i watch a lot of the rig rundowns on premier guitar yeah and I don't think they delve enough of why. Yeah. Hey, look at this cool guitar. This is about the guitar. Okay. Sometimes the guys will say, well, I chose this guitar, this company because of this. I started with this. And some guys still have the guitars they started with. Yep. Those are the ones I like the most. 
<laughs> yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Yeah, to get back to the show, um, we were talking on Saturday or Sunday um, over coffee, Allison and I, and um, usually that's kind of when we're having our 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 meeting, our High Desert Lutheran meeting, and <laughs> um, you know, putting together the next blog and stuff like that over coffee. And we had been talking about like we need to do this thing, like we need to get the podcast going. Uh, this will be a great way to. Uh, get to know everybody because at the show it's impossible no um, way. yeah there's no way and yeah and i mean like i'm working double duty you know trying to man my booth and also um you know just kind of keep an eye on everything and answer any questions anybody might have so it's just not going to happen there and um you know we all lead different lives and uh you know yes work and you know, like, uh, even though you live down the street, like, <laughs> right, it's it's tricky, like, getting around to visit everyone. And um, the other thing that came up from, I think, a couple of the builders from the last show brought up is, like, it'd be cool to get together, like, have, like, a hangout. Yeah. And one thing that, like, I've been trying to sort of, uh, I don't know, let go or accept is like uh, everyone has different priorities and wants and hanging out is not one of mine. Like I'm kind of a homebody. I am too. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, like for me, that's not a big thing, but also putting the show together is enough work already. And like, uh, um, you know, I, I've never really done anything like this until uh, this last show. And uh, that one was pretty last minute, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but because of the circumstances and, um, you know, putting this bigger show together in for June, you know, I, I've had the time I've been hurt and, you know, not being able to move around. It's like, well, what am I going to do with my time? Um, <laughs> you know, let's let's put the show together, you know. And so like all the vendors are booked, all the music's booked. Um, cool. And and I was kind of sitting there in a show hole. <laughs> what do I what do I do now? And um, and so we decided like let's just do the podcast. And I kind of sent a message out to a few people, and uh, I just like I have a list of uh, all of the vendors. And uh, prior to you coming on, I was just kind of rehearsing. Uh, I have a little intro that we wrote up. Uh, talking about the High Desert Lutheran Invitational or the HDLI oh. for short, you know, and um, just like, you know, just real brief, like a minute or something. And But the vendors, like when I call people vendors, they're like, what does that mean? Are you going to have like food or something? And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, no, no. Well, it, it's not all guitar makers. Like there's luthiers of all different sorts. And then there's yeah. musicians and then there's everything in between. So like amplifier makers, effects pedal makers. And, you know, my my sweet fantasy was to have uh, uh, guitar parts manufacturers, uh, you know, here. Mm -hmm. And even uh, some of the tool companies and you know, being that it's a new show and nobody really knows about it or anything like that, hardly anyone was uh, willing to take a risk on doing that. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but the people that I did get involved genuinely wanted to be here and uh, cool. didn't, didn't hesitate to get involved. And I, I really appreciate that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, with all of that said, um, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, tell everyone who you are, the name of your company, and um, where you are in the U.S.? Okay. My name is Pat Hepburn. I am Goatee Skull Guitars. I'm here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is an awesome place that I love. They call it the land of entrapment. Not the case for me because I love it here. I move, I've lived all around the country, and this is where I choose to make my home. So, and I'm very thankful that I'm here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, so I'm also here in Albuquerque, and Pat lives down the street from me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think one of the, the really cool things about Albuquerque, so I moved here from California a handful of years ago, uh, maybe a little longer, and, um, 
it's so easy to get around yeah out here um and uh when i'm not making guitars i work at uh the local wood shop where most of us go to buy wood and uh i'm you know i'm there a couple of days a week and um you know other ways i supplement my income i do a uh, delivery driving uh prior to that i was doing other jobs where i was just locked in a shop all day and uh i was roasting coffee and so i was there really early and um you know just never went anywhere and i basically lived at that shop and uh, i never got to get around um and i kind of like got that job pretty soon after we moved here and you know and kept that job for for a good amount of time and so the delivery driving lets me get around town and it's so easy to get around here yeah um, totally yeah and i mean it's a big city but it's not that big yeah uh, you know you can get from one end to the other sometimes in 20 minutes <laughs> you know sometimes sometimes not <laughs> Sometimes not. It just depends, you know, depends on what time you're out and what day it is. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a really neat little area um, in that it's sort of like condensed. Um, yeah. And there's so many builders here. Uh, yeah, which it, I never knew. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the show together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I see a bunch of guitars behind you. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of jealous. Like I, I don't have like this, uh, this cool spot. Like you know, this cool background. Other than the poster that everyone autographed at the last show. And I see my name on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I was interviewing a friend yesterday, and he had a similar background with his guitars hanging, and I was like, oh man, that's so cool. Oh, that's and I do have right there is from the show. Oh, cool. Right on. Very proud. As a matter of fact, I even have my my badge. Oh, awesome! Yeah, I, I well, still have my. I'm like still to collect so excited them. about that last show because I got to meet some awesome people. Some people that I haven't seen, also that I've known for many years, and it was just it was really nice talking to them. So it was pretty cool. Awesome, awesome. So getting back to the guitars behind you, um, what types of instruments do you make? Um, I make basses and guitars primarily. Um, I've done, um, some cigar box guitars, which I'd like to try and get one done by the next show. Um, I made myself a <laughs> wine box bass, which was a lot of fun. Um, I will build almost anything. I like making, um, all stringed instruments. And I like to use a recycled wood whenever I can. Cause, awesome. Yeah, it's kind of a lot of fun doing that. Yeah, and, and by recycled, do you mean like a, sort of like reclaimed uh, lumber from like yeah. barnyards and stuff like so that? So it started with, well, my family had an old table that I grew up as a kid with. And it was our dining room table made out of pine. The guy who built it, ironically, I was a, very young, but we went to the same carpentry teacher in high school. And nobody wanted the table anymore. So I turned it into eight guitars. And it was 50-year-old, two-inch thick pine. Just, oh, great sounds. I have two more guitars left. My grandson got the very first one that I built. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I really, uh, I love it when these, uh, you know, we kind of start from, or the origin story, you know, is with yeah. something getting, getting upcycled and then getting passed on to the next generation. Um, it's so cool because in a way you're able to kind of keep that, you know, whatever got recycled or upcycled in the family. Uh, yeah, it, that was kind of the biggest part when I built that for him. Yeah. Uh, aside from guitar work, do you do any other work to, you know, to pay the bills, so to speak? Yeah, so I'm a full-time uh, maintenance mechanic for the post office. So I work on all the machines. I do all the electronics and all the mechanical stuff. Wow. I all-around fix-it guy. Awesome. 
That's great. I'm sure that uh, ingenuity, you know, is is a great talent to have for, uh, uh, in, in all honesty, a superpower. Uh, when yeah, I guess so. problem solving, yeah, when problem solving some of these uh, odd situations we might find ourselves in with some of our builds. Oh man, yeah, definitely. Because <laughs> you don't, I build outside the box. At least I try to. So then, when I get to it, I'm like, ah, uh, what do I do now? And then you figure it out. Right on, right on. So you mentioned uh, reclaimed lumber. Um, right. Do you have a favorite material to work with, like outside of that? Or is there a certain like um, kind of uh, or type of uh, reclaimed wood that you look for? Well, I love using pine, but I started using cottonwood recently. Because um, it's sustainable. It's something here in our community that... A lot of times just gets overlooked and um, thrown away or burnt. So um, I've been able to get some really good solid pieces. And um, so I can make a solid body of one piece of wood, which is really hard to come by nowadays. So, yeah, yeah that wood's been a lot of fun. It's been challenging, but still. Yeah, the, the, um, I, I, I am starting to enjoy working with uh, what I just, you know, simply call one piece body blanks. Um, yeah. I um, working at the wood shop gives me the opportunity, you know, to kind of get first dibs on, on stuff uh, every cool. week as it's coming <laughs> in, you know, and then, uh, you know, like whenever the exotic wood shipments come into um it's uh, one of the reasons why I took that job and, um, you know, uh, being a luthier as well, you know, it, it's, it's a sickness. <laughs> it's almost. Oh yeah, thing. totally. <laughs> yeah, see, if I worked there, man, I could not do it. I would, my entire paycheck would go to wood. Yeah. That's an ongoing joke too. Uh, I don't even know why we bothered paying Perry. He's, uh, <laughs> he's going to give us the money back. Um, you know, but it, it's, uh, it, it's a great job, and I found myself really uh, up until then. I never really had access to um, um, like one piece body blanks um, yeah, at the hard, at the lumber yards that I was going to, and um, the you know ordering stuff. Um, it just didn't make sense monetarily for what um, what I was doing uh, yeah. in my own shop. You know, when there's a budget involved, if a one piece body is going to, you know, run me, you know, 150 bucks or more when I could glue up, you know, two pieces of wood for a fraction of that, um, you know, I just wasn't into that. And I had all the machinery definitely to, to process uh, raw lumber. And uh, if you've never been to a lumber yard before, raw lumber is a lot cheaper than yeah. Uh, you know, surfaced on all sides lumber or even uh, glued up body blanks, um, you know, and, and so, yeah, so taking the job at the, at, at uh, the exotic wood shop, um, you know, we were just kind of talking about, well, what's easier, you know, like they don't have a joiner. Um, so gluing up body blanks was sort of out of the question. And, um, yeah. and we were like, let's just do one piece bodies, you know, we'll run them through the planer. They've got a pretty wide planer and um, get them close to thickness of like, you know, standard one and three quarters fender, you know, fender dimensions. And, uh, and we'll just, you know, if a board comes in, we'll just chop it up and, uh, or we'll chop a couple pieces off. And um, I think the other really cool thing is about that shop is they kind of get more regional wood in, um, yeah. And uh, so you get that cottonwood. So getting back to cottonwood, um, what about it resonates with you? Um, so I'm. it was kind of interesting. One of the questions was what inspires me and the world around me and nature. So with cottonwood, walking down the trail by the Rio Grande, you see all these beautiful cottonwood trees. And then you'll see that they cut some giant pieces just for taking care of the forest there. And I was like, oh, if I could only have one of those pieces. You know, it probably weighs 500 pounds. Like, how the heck am I going to get it off the trail and home, you know? So 
I was really, I just, I thought it was a beautiful wood. And then once I started the first blanks that I got the big piece and started cutting blanks, I got such great figures and, and just, it just came out so beautiful. Like I haven't stayed, I have a commission piece that I'm about to stain after I go see the planer today over at your shop. <laughs> and, um, but the, the wood grain is just phenomenal in it. It's something different that I haven't seen before. So that's what I love about it. Okay. And um, so, uh, and I'm just, I'm doing this for anybody that's not familiar with cottonwood. Because uh, oh, okay. I wasn't really familiar with it before I moved out here. What, um, I, I'm a big fan of wood alternates, right? So the, the industry yeah. standard you got mahogany, you've got alder, uh, let's just say the mahogany is right, uh, mahogany yeah. types of wood. Uh, we've got alder, and then I would say, you know, maple, um, uh, and yeah. then the next probably most common wood is going to be uh, rosewoods and maybe like acacias like koa. Um, how how oh, would yeah. you, what wood would you like in cottonwood to? Um, poplar. It's part Popular. of the popular family. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's a, it's a hardwood, but it's actually the softest, one of the softest hardwoods. Um, okay. So I actually have to use a hardener with it, um, which makes a huge difference. So I'll get it shaped, and then I'll do the hardener on it before I do anything else. And then I have to go through, sand down all the hardener, the surface stuff to get down but um using the hardener and i do that with pine too because it's such a it's a softwood and um by doing the hardener i think that makes a big difference afterwards when i start doing the finer parts of it because before i put it on sanding it is horrible <laughs> so um but the extra work i think you know it, it's worth it Okay, and so is it kind of punky, like uh, maybe like a sycamore? Yeah, <laughs> punky is a great name for it. Um, so it's it kind of the it's not like a standard grain in the wood. Say, so, okay, if I cut this, all the grain's going to go this way. If I sand on this side, this will happen. Or like when you're routing out the wood, you know, there's certain points as you're routing out the the body that you know, okay, I need to be more careful up here because the wood's going to splinter out. It's all over on cottonwood. Oh, uh, interesting. And do you think that's, uh, do you, is it because the, from what I've seen, the grain is really far apart. So it seems like a pretty fast growing tree. So it's more sort of ambiguous or not clear where the end grain is. Yeah. That's okay. a, that's perfect. That's so perfect. when you're working with like a big slab. So at the uh, <laughs> at the wood shop, um, the cotton wood is in these pretty big slabs, and um, and the slabs are a good like three inches thick um, for the <laughs> most part. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, it's really neat to see all of the, these different species coming in in such huge sizes. Um, it, it really is. Yeah, I'm I'm totally jealous. Believe me. <laughs> i love it there i'm going there right after this matter of fact so and and well yeah that's really cool i'm i'm going back tomorrow um finally after getting oh, good hurt. yeah we dropped a slab on my leg um uh right before yeah. christmas and um we didn't really drop it we were moving it and the dolly gave way and uh smashed me pretty hard and um it Dude. was uh I've been on the couch since, um, on, on the mend. It, it's healing up, uh, really nicely. Um, uh, but it, it was, uh, it was a pretty scary thing. And, um, Oh yeah. We got through it. <laughs> yeah. People don't realize how heavy, you know, you don't normally see that giant slab. Yeah. You guys get it. Right. And, you know, people go to Home Depot or Lowe's. Oh, look at the pretty little pine pieces. You know, they have no idea what a giant slab of wood, how heavy it is and what yeah. damage it can do. Oh, yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, 
And uh, up until then, I'd never been hurt in the wood shop. You know, still got all of these. And uh, <laughs> yeah. and so to get hurt that way, it just reminded me uh, that you can, anything can happen at any time. And uh, you can get hurt in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and so this definitely has me um, a little more crispy in the shop uh, for sure. You know, it yeah. was, we were moving slabs all the time. And uh, the dolly just said, you know, um, F you, <laughs> I'm talking, <tired. laughs> and, um, you know, and, and, and what happened to happen. Um, so tonally for Cottonwood, um, like tone is so subjective. Um, I agree. And it's so hard to get a clear answer, uh, especially, well, with any instrument, Um but like having used cottonwood a few times now, uh, how would you describe the the tone that as you're understanding it? Um, I'm gonna. It's kind of more like maybe an alder. Okay, so the way that I describe alder is it's very neutral. It's very balanced. If I'm looking at an EQ. Essentially, all of the sliders are just right in the middle. So in a yeah. way, it's flat um, or what I call neutral. There's no frequency like bass or treble or mid that's pronounced, but there's no dip either. Um, it's just nice and flat and neutral, and it's a great starting point. Yeah, and that's really why I think of it like that. Because as you said that, I was going, all right, my two things are mahogany, maple. It's kind of in between. That's why I thought of all. Yeah, and, and then just having some experience working with cottonwood, I've noticed that the grain structure on it, it's kind of like a, a, a puff pastry. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, I have some examples behind me. Pull one, pull one up. So this guy. When I did it, if you can see that grain in there. I certainly it's, can. It's just crazy, and that's sideways. But that's only one. Then you take this one. It's kind of a glare, but it's such a different texture, you know, like I love this right here. Yeah. All the color. And it just, it's so diverse on every piece that you cut. And uh, weight wise, how would you describe it? Cause those are um, pretty, pretty good size instruments. Yeah. They, um, it's not as heavy as I thought it would be. It's not a Les Paul heavy, but it's heavier than a Strat. Okay. All right. All right. So, you know, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And like the base itself, I mean, it's a really solid piece. There's not a lot cut out of it. Where I have another one that, um, because of the pickups I put in it, it lightened it up a lot because I had to cut a lot out underneath the pick guard. Hmm. So I don't want to go, I'm making another guitar, which I'm using Poplar. So we'll see. But it's a pretty long guitar. So in my head, you know, I got these great single pieces. How much do I really want to cut out? And do I want to add something to it? So after I plane it today, I will make that decision. But yeah, it's um, they're really not too bad weight-wise. I mean, they're not super light. Um, but I think they give you a good feel. The bass... I think it's got to be a big guy to play that bass because <laughs> I made such a long bass. <laughs> That's so a like, big man. Yeah, I see on that bass you have the grain. Um, so that bass and, and the guitar came out of a uh, a slab a of, of cottonwood. And um, I see that you have the grain kind of uh, at a 45 um, for that shape. Um, what, what made you want to do that? Because most, you know, most of the time the industry sort of dictates that the grain is running one way 
And there's yeah. all these crazy ideas about how much tension the guitar is under. And even if you measure it, like when it comes down to what it actually is, it's not a whole lot on an electric no. guitar. Um, so like uh, what, what made you want to, you know, change the orientation of the grain? Total accident. <laughs> not going to lie. So um, as I was cutting everything, the way that fit on that slab for what I wanted to take out of the slab was great, but mine's not, um, it hasn't been planed. I, I've gotten a piece that wasn't planed and it, it just, I had no idea what was underneath till I planed it and started sanding it. And I said, Oh wow, look what I did by accident. So because cotton one doesn't seem like the grain goes in a straight line. It's like really weird that that one came out like that. It was a wonderful accident. Okay. So that's the truth behind it. <laughs> right on. I, I love when that sort of thing happens. Because uh, like visually, it creates a lot of movement with that design. Uh, Thanks, man. And, you know, one of, my, one of my things is design. I just, I love uh, uh, design of all sorts. Um, Me too. You know, I, I pull inspiration from all sorts of things that I see. Um, and when um, a big part of my practice in luthery is uh, sort of being unorthodox or trying to be fresh with uh, old ideas. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I draw a lot of inspiration from Fender instruments, for instance. And so like uh, one of my main uh, body styles is, is a telecaster style and um you know i love tellies <laughs> yeah and 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 how well you know i take the approach of what can i do with this that keeps it familiar but makes it fresh at the same time and um i really respect how you're so outside of the box like i could see Thanks, gibson inspiration looking at your walls here um i also see some like uh, uh the older companies like burns and I see uh, definitely some Fender inspiration. Um, but like when we're talking about like specifically guitars and brands, um, you know, where do you pull um, your inspiration from um, for your designs? I think a lot of it has to do with the 60s Japanese guitars. Okay. So growing up, I'm a little older. Uh, I grew up in the 70s. And my next door neighbor was my big influence. His name was Jack Reed, played guitar and bass, sang. Um, he was a lefty. So um, I'd watch him play as a little kid, and it was like looking in a mirror. So that's how I learned to play. Um, the thing that really sticks in my head is he had a Kimberly Lafayette. And for those of you that don't know, it is a... Japanese guitar has four pickups on it. Has um, this crazy pick guard with little flowers all over it, and it is um, a green burst guitar. Wow! All right, and this guitar sticks in my head from when I was a little kid. And back then, your first guitar was always a Japanese guitar. Okay, from the sixties because it costs like thirty dollars to get a guitar. Because they were used and they weren't super great. Some were, but some weren't. And um, a lot of shapes and designs from that era. Um, if you ever look at Drowning in Guitars, I believe the guy's name is Frank Myers. He is also into them. He has a um, he does an article in Premier Guitar and breaks out a lot of those old, unique guitars from that era, but he also looks at Italian guitars. I just think in the US we have Les Pauls, we have Telecasters, we have Strats, and granted a lot of those influenced them, but then I look at Burns, which is another one that I, I like a lot. And um, matter of fact, I'm getting ready, first time using Burns bass pickups. I'm building a oh, bass. Cool. Um, with five pickups oh, to match wow. the purple one. The guy who bought the purple guitar wanted me to make a matching bass. So, uh, awesome. 
and out of cottonwood. So that's because the the base I made was basswood. A lot easier to work with. So this is going to be a good challenge. Yeah, and so to fill the listeners in, um, you know, you were one of the vendors at the last show in December, yeah. and um, somebody bought one of your instruments that you met yeah. at the show. Yeah, which was awesome. That's and that's amazing. I I didn't, you know, having done multiple different types of shows, um, I I'm fully aware that high ticket items are not necessarily going to sell at the show. But I I am aware of the power of networking and talking to the people and passing out cards and um, yeah. how how that's uh, you know follow ups after. Um, any sort of event are so important and um, and can lead to sales. Um, and so I, I've been just, as I hear of different builders selling things, uh, it, you know, I'm just delighted. Like, it, it's amazing. I didn't, like, I didn't expect anything to happen. I had no expectations going into this show. No, neither did I, to be honest. Um, the thing that I loved about it, it was we do a different kind of artwork. Um, I build, I, in my past, I've built all kinds of things and have had opportunities at a craft fair or have my piece at an art gallery. With instruments, you don't have that. What do you mean? Like, are you saying that we don't have like the uh, uh, opportunity to sell like at these other events or? Yeah, we don't have a gal say a gallery for people to come look at our artwork and say, "Hey, that's awesome," or a show to look at our artwork and say, "Oh, I like how this guy does this," or "I like how that guy does that." We don't have that except when we had this High Desert Luthery Invitational. Yeah. So my biggest thing was just to show people what we do and then have them ask us questions because. I'm excited about my builds. I love doing it. The only other way I sell them is on reverb. So that constitutes me building it, doing lots of pictures, doing a video of playing so they know what it sounds like, posting everything up there and hoping for the best. Yeah. Yeah, and and um, and I think uh, you know what you're speaking to. Uh, just to be a little more clear, because you know this is going out to people, you yeah. know, all over the place that want to listen. Uh, we're in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and there are music stores here, but for the most part, they're your typical music store that is doing mainly you know lessons and catering to the new um, student uh, right. level. So that reflects in the instruments that are carried, which are going to be either like name brand or generic in the uh, sort of like hundred dollar to maybe five hundred dollar range. Right. Uh, and then uh, the next sort of tier up would be uh, from five hundred dollars to maybe like twelve hundred dollars. Um, that's kind of the typical range that I've seen here. And there might be stuff that, you know, builds or guitars that, that exceed that. But if they do, they're going to be your typical main labels. Um, yeah, your Fender, that's your the big Fender, thing right your there. Your ERS, uh, Jackson. And uh, oddly enough, here in Albuquerque, there's a huge Van Halen scene. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Which I love. Don't get me wrong. I love Eddie Van Halen. But Wow. All the guitar I'm seeing tons of Van Halen guitars. Yeah, there's one of the one of the shops. One of my uh, um, friends said, "Oh, do you mean that Van Halen shop?" Uh, and I was <laughs> cracking up. It's so, true. That's pretty funny. Um, and because, like, I I guess some of the I don't really go to a whole lot of the music stores here. Um, I'm just kind of an oddball. Like, I'm not a gear guy. Um, no. And and so like I I enjoy making different things, uh, but I've never really been married to my gear. I've tried a bunch of stuff out, but like I feel like uh, the only time a brand name and it wasn't even a brand, it was what the guitar was. And I saw Stevie Ray playing a Strat, and I had to have it. Um, yeah. And that was what inspired me to play. You know, like that was the only time 
that I was super influenced to get that thing. Um, and after that, it was just like whatever came my way, I'd give it a try if it looked cool, if it sounded cool, um, you know, whatever it was, I'll give it a shot. Um, and I just love how um, what I'll call again unorthodox, which is a lot of times how how builders are looked at, you know, we're not falling into the making the same thing that everyone else is making. We do exactly. our own thing a lot of times. And I love how unorthodox and fresh your designs are. Thanks, um, can you talk about like, for instance, this, it's like a, a smash up of a tally and an explorer. Like what, oh, uh, what yeah. inspired you for, what inspired you to make that? So I love telecasters. Like, I know they're one of the first ones that Leo came out with, but I love them. But man, do I love an Explorer. I don't own one. I've never owned one. And I will make myself one just because I want one. But I love that design. So that one, it was, everybody looks at it and tries to think of different things, but it's really more a mashup of uh, an Explorer, but kind of rounded off more and um a telly even though the pickups are really i did something different use jazz masters instead of p90s oh and uh, i do i have a six-way switch on there so I, i'm really an electronics guy too yeah let's touch on that um, why don't why don't you get into more of like things that you like to do with electronics so i i don't like being the same as everybody else because you know what Everybody has um, a humbucker or a double humbucker guitar or a strat with three single coils. Um, this one, I happened to, I had met a gentleman named Mike from Warp Core Pickups. He's in Tucson. Oh, yeah. And a great guy. And I said, well, I got this idea because I love this guitar by Tesco called the Spectrum 5. So it has six individual pickups on it, three on the bass side and three on the treble side, but they're set up as single pickups. And I love Railhammer pickups um, by Reverend. So I had him make me custom pickups. And oh, everybody saw them and they're like, oh, Leo Fender did that with GNL. I said, yeah, but that's not what it's based on. It's really based on that Japanese guitar, the Spectrum 5. So um, I asked Mike if he could make them. He made them. And I didn't know what a challenge it would be fitting them in that space. Right. So, and with the electronics, you know, I do switching. Um, these ones, they all have separate on-off switches so you can get any combination. So can you show us the, the electronics, the switches and the knobs? I actually made, I have my own version of a TBX tone control. Okay. So you can cut bass and you can cut treble frequencies. So you can get kind of any different tone you want out of it. The on-off switches, they're actually um, off is in the middle and then it's phase reversal on those. Okay. So each one you can turn on and off. And you can do phase reversal, um, standard tone, I mean, standard volume. And I really only like doing a TBX with a volume on most of my builds. I think uh, for me personally, when I play, everything's on 10. And whatever tone I get is from the pickups or me playing. Nice. I feel the same way. <laughs> I am kind of really... It's been my whole life. Turn it all the way up and play, and whatever comes out, it's your own fault. Yeah. But I try to give people uh, diversity when I build something. Nice. Yeah, I, I can see that with your controls. So uh, with the TBX control, uh, the way that you're hearing it when you plug it in, does it maintain the mid frequencies pretty well? It does. Um, that was the whole thing. when uh, If you guys – if anybody ever gets the one from Fender and sets it up in their guitar, you got popping in it. Um, I don't think you really get a drastic amount 
of what you're looking for. So in doing research, which is something I love doing, um, there's a guy named Dirk Wacker. Oh, yeah. From Germany. And uh, he is singlecoil.com um, is his website. And he is an amazing mod guy. So people challenge him all the time. He's been building and repairing for many years. And he has his article in Premier Guitar. That's how I stepped across him. And um, so he takes your basic electronics and makes you think about a different way of doing things. Um, or people's guitars like uh, Brent Mason's guitar. Uh, he has a tally. And Mr. Seymour Duncan hooked him up with some pickups and some crazy um, switching on that back in the day. And he explains everything, how this came about. So reading his articles really inspires me to do something different when I do a build. I won't do a, a separate thing. Like for the one behind me over there, it just has a three-way switch, but the middle position is in serial instead of parallel so it's in oh. series so that way you if you hit the middle you get more of a a lead boost if oh you, that's if really cool um same with the six way i have on that other one i just i feel like if you give somebody one instrument with a lot of different options and there's somebody who knows how to play or um it gives them uh, a huge tonal palette to do something different to get yeah. a sound that they normally wouldn't get from a standard strat or Les Paul or something of that nature. So um, all my electronics are always going to be something different in that guitar. Yeah. And so is that six way switch, is it a blade switch or is it a rotary switch? Yeah. So it's a blade switch. Um, Stu Mac, there's a company called Freeway that makes um, a five-way switch that's an actually 10-way switch. And it's a blade. And that one happens to be a blade. They make a toggle one, too. And um, I used the toggle one years ago on a guitar I built for me. It's like, oh, that's a cool idea. I got three pickups in here, six-way switch. Because I never understood why uh, Gibson would put a middle pickup in. And you couldn't use the middle pickup by itself. Okay. Because that's a whole different sound. Right. You could only blend it with either the bridge or the neck. You can never have that middle pickup by itself. So that always bugged me. And I have an Epiphone that I threw a third uh, P90 in it for me. And I love the sound of that middle P90. Yeah, that middle position is money. Um, yeah. I I have a couple of guitars that I made. Uh, I tend to make single pickup guitars. And, yeah, you do. Um, my favorite position is the middle position. And um, it just, it, it's sort of a sweet spot for my ear. And, yeah. and, and it looks different. You know, we're so used to seeing the single pickup uh, in the bridge. And then, you know, if you get to work on arch top guitars, that single pickup is, uh, you know, fastened to the neck. Yeah, which is so cool. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's true. The middle, I think the middle position doesn't get used enough. Yeah, and it's about where a P pickup is usually. Yeah. Um, and and that, you know, it, it really is a sweet spot, I feel, and it's overlooked a lot. Uh, but there are plenty of builders, you know, putting a, putting a single pickup there. Uh, yeah. That tends to be right around the sweet spot for a strat most of the time, too. And yeah, that's true. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's not too dark. It's not too far away from the bridge and it's not too close to the bridge. Um, you know, and I'm going to be playing around with that on some next builds that are going to this next show. Um, the HDLI 24. Which is going to be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I know. I, I, matter of fact, I'm putting a, uh, on one of my builds, I'm taking the neck tele pickup. I put a open um cover on it and i'm putting it in the middle position so i'm waiting to see how that sounds oh yeah that's a great sound um i don't remember who did it i came across a video last year um where somebody was trying maybe like two bridge pickups in a tally 
you know, one in the neck, one in the bridge. And that sounded tremendous. Um, and then yeah. two neck pickups and, uh, you know, the same thing, one in the neck, one in the bridge. And it sounded, it sounded incredible. And it's sort of an idea that I'd been kicking around for a long time. And, and, you know, like there, there's so much saturation, market saturation. Now there's so many builders out there. There's so many people doing these things that it's, you know, it's almost impossible to, to come up with a, a 100% original idea and, you know, like for for myself, I get busy doing so many other things, uh, you know, working to pay the bills that I don't have time to do one of these experiments. And so to come across somebody doing that and like be like, oh, what I was hearing in my head was pretty accurate. Like, that's really cool. Yeah, it's true. And that's really how it comes about. You hear something different. You're like, hmm, I wonder if I could do something with that. Yeah. 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 Thank you again for making the show. Um, because you're showing our artwork off to the masses. And there were a lot of people at that last show. This one, I think, is going to be even better. I really do. Awesome. Awesome. I, I'm glad you feel that way. Um, is there anything you'd like to share with the community? Um. Quit calling this place the land of entrapment. It's I thought it was the place. land of uh, enchantment. <laughs> uh, I keep saying entrapment, but I've lived all over, and this is one of the most beautiful cities, and we have great people um, and great community as a whole. Um, from the art community, I, I know so many fantastic artists, um, musicians. You know, the musicians here are phenomenal. Uh, I've been lucky enough to play in some bands here. Um with my Native American brothers and sisters and the knowledge that I gained from them was beautiful. It It is a beautiful place, man. And just keep it real here and enjoy New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. So uh, do you have any local artists that you're working with or that are playing your instruments right now? Um, I do not at this time. Well, I have a local guy, but he's not, I don't think he's performing yet. So okay. we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Most of my yeah. stuff's been uh, sent to New York to, for people to play. So <laughs> cool. Very cool. So, um, you know, wrapping things up, um, yeah. where can we find you? What are, what are your uh, socials? Yeah. Do you have a website? Um, my website, I just started and I'm working on it to be cool. Um, I just have some basic stuff on there describing what I do. Um, you guys can find me on Instagram. Oh, very cool. At um, GoTSkullGuitars.com. It's my fancy logo. And for those of you, this is how my logo started out. Because <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to make a stencil to put on my guitar case. So that's how it started. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. And and uh, and where does the name come from? Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, as you guys see, I've had this goatee for a really long time, and uh, I love skulls, and I love cool guitar shop shirts. I always thought that it would be cool if I had a really cool guitar shop shirt. Okay, so that's how the logo came about. To be honest, <laughs> right on. That's so cool. That is so cool. Well, well thanks for uh, joining me today. And Harry, thank you so much for everything, man. Yeah. And hopefully, since we live down the block from each other, eventually I'll see you soon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I told you that the next visit would be at your shop. And, yep. um, you know, just give me the heads up and I will roll right over there. It's a mess, but um, because... You told me about a great router, so I'm making a giant router table built into my my workbench because of the router you suggested. So, and I bought right it. On. Right <laughs> on. Yeah, I, I need to take my own advice. My router is uh, it, it's a little tired, and um, you, you know, you ever hit that that point where you've got to replace like everything in the shop? Yes. <laughs> oh man, it's like. I'm looking at my pocketbook and, you know, I've been riding the bench for 
almost a month now, and I'm just going, oh, dear. What am I going to do, man? I got to get back to work to be able to get back to work. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a funny situation, um, and I don't mind talking about it. I feel like uh, these are like sort of, uh, this is reality, you know. And it is. We don't live this fabulous life where we just build guitars 247 and be these amazing artists. We got to work for a living to make that happen. Yeah. That's you the know, tough part. It's, uh, and, and it's often, you know, like um, not represented. Um, you know, what, what people get through social media is sort of the, you know, what I said earlier, the sweet fantasy, right, of, uh, yep. oh, man, this guy, you know, builds a lot. And, and, and you know, teaching guitar making, um, I hear quite often from students and even from some of my um, uh, repair clients, you know, well, I don't do this 24-7. Um, and this is sort of like coming from making excuses of why, you know, why they can't do it. Um, which is a whole, it's a whole other thing. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I don't, I don't have the space or, uh, I don't do this 24 seven. And I'm like, I don't either. <laughs> like not right now. And there have oh. been times, you know, where, where I was able to do this 24 seven and, um, it's certainly not happening right now. And I think Been it's very, very important to share that, you know, and when we get to the show with as many builds as we come up with, like, that's a pretty amazing accomplishment. Uh, it's it, tough. Yeah. You Dude, know, like, like all your builds, and don't mind me saying this because I, I kind of idolize how you build stuff. Oh, like, thank you. Your builds are incredible. I've been to your shop. I've seen your builds as you're building them. And then all of a sudden I see them at the show and I'm like, holy shit, how did he pull this off? <laughs> so, yeah, dude. I mean, because I, I know your builds and how intense they are, some of them. But then I've watched you build a neck. And to me, building a neck is one of the hardest parts of doing this. You building a neck takes you... A little bit to do just because you're so good at it so you know it's and the diversity in your builds like a certain base that i'm in love with you know which one i'm talking about yeah and uh but i think that one's for you though isn't it yeah yeah when i can get it to work um you know and and uh i i love that you bring this up and thank you so much uh um, oh, dude you for awesome. your kind words um <laughs> uh that i i name my body styles um and um you know i'll i'll build i'll make you know more of the same shape um uh, but the shape usually will change with every build slightly yeah. as my ideas about it change um or i new, learn new tricks or um you know sometimes just based on uh the size of wood that i'm working with um, yeah. you know, sometimes it's just a little narrow, sometimes it's a little short, um, uh, and I work with it. I, I make yeah. it work. Um, and, uh, that, that base build, um, I haven't actually got back to work in my garage since the last, um, the last show in early December. Um, I just, I went to work immediately afterwards and, um, Got hurt immediately after, and then I got hurt, and I the everything's still in the same place it was. Um, I had some time to return some amps that I borrowed, and um, and that was it. Um, and so like that that build, you know, to talk about that build, um, it was a struggle like from the get go, and um, you know, you could say that it was a lack of planning. A lot of times I plan these builds out um from the beginning so that there's any surprises that happen are from material you know uh not you know fighting back um yeah. and um i didn't i didn't have any planning i just threw these things together and i ran into a lot of obstacles uh fitting things together um uh and then at the very end the uh the truss rod in the neck it it snapped oh. it just gave up i went to adjust it once and um you know and i tell i've heard from some people well i've never had that happen and you know what great <laughs> I have. good 
good for you. And, um, you know, for other people, it's like, wow, does that happen often? I'm like, if you make enough uh, instruments, you know, I'm ordering truss rods by, you know, 20, 30 at a time and flying exactly. through them because I, I make necks for other builders, uh, for other people. And uh, it's bound to happen, you know, and I've had it happen so many times, uh, you know, through all the years I've been doing this, that it's just like, oh, man. Um but then I go, well, I wanted to make a different neck for that base anyway, so we'll just peel the fingerboard off of it yeah. and do do a fancy glue up and uh, probably do dual truss rods. And it gives me the excuse to um, to sort of like make what what I actually wanted to make. Which is uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully I'll get that together sooner than later. And and then we can try it out and see what it sounds like. Oh, I'm dying to hear it. I yeah. am so dying to hear that. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Thanks for joining me today, Patrick. I really oh, appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, yeah. What are you up to for the rest of your day? I am going to go get two pieces of wood planed. Um, I finished templates um, yesterday. And uh, I am ready to cut some bodies. Right so on. See, I'm doing something a little different on one of them because uh, I'm putting a tremolo on it. Okay. And, uh, so I have to do a three degree neck angle on what, the. What neck. type of what type of trim is it? It's a Wigsby. Mm. All right. The infamous Wigsby, not All a Bigsby. Right. It's Wilkinson's version of a tremolo, and they named it Wigsby. All right. I really bought it just for the fun of it. And I'm building the whole instrument based on it. Cool. Very cool. I'm very excited to see that. Um, yeah, and it will I'm... be my um, my Mexican blanket finish. Oh, nice. So it's going to be a pretty insane guitar, and it's kind of long. Because of that tremolo, it's a lot longer than I thought it would be. So I have to come up with weight reduction. We'll see how that goes. Right on, right on. Well, you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will. You too, my friend. Thank you. And I will. I'll see you soon, man. All right. All right. Take care, Patrick. Peace, brother.